Have you ever been scuba diving? Talk to a scuba diver and they'll probably tell you that it's the greatest thing ever. But scuba diving isn't easy. It takes hard work, training, and a lot of hours in the water. You need to develop experience. If you decide to do it, here's one piece of advice. Go early in the day. Why you ask? When scuba divers swim along the bottom, they kick up sand and other sediment into the water. We refer to this phenomenon as turbidity. Turbidity is the presence of particles suspended in water. The particles may be microscopic organisms, pollution, or sediment like sand. Any particles that are small and light enough that they do not immediately sink to the ocean floor cause turbidity. These particles act like smoke in the water, adding to its cloudiness. Under the right conditions, particles kicked up by a scuba diver may ultimately settle to the surface and be redeposited on the seafloor. However, this takes time. Fine grain sediment in the water can stay suspended there for hours or more. And until then, the particles in the water will block light, limit your vision, and obscure the scenery around you. The best way to avoid turbidity and have the best experience at a popular dive site is to get up early and beat the crowds. If turbidity teaches us one thing, it's that sediment moves over time. Sedimentology is the science of sediment. It covers everything from the formation and erosion of sediment to its deposition and lithification. Sediment forms from a variety of sources. Lithogenous sediment forms from the breakdown of igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rock. Biogenous sediment forms from the hard, mineralized shells of organisms. Hydrogenous sediment forms from chemical precipitation reactions in water. And cosmogenous sediment forms from material brought to Earth from outer space. Regardless of how the sediment forms, it is almost always transported from its place of origin by agents of erosion, gravity, wind, running water, and ice. Sediment has a tendency to move downhill with gravity. It will blow in the wind. And when there is turbidity, sediment particles suspended in water will move in the direction of the current or downhill in the direction of gravity. The growth of glaciers and ice sheets, which till the earth as they advance over the landscape, can also move sediment. At the end of their journey, the sediment will be deposited and spread out. The deposition of sediment is more correctly called sedimentation. It is the settling of particles out of wind or air so that they are no longer in motion. The sediment spread out into layers called strata. The sediment may ultimately undergo lithification, becoming compacted and cemented into sedimentary rock. Let's focus now on the history of sediment between its origin and its deposition. Where and why does sedimentation take place? What causes sediment to be deposited? It is important to recognize the movement of sediment requires energy. Wind provides energy. So does water and gravity. For sedimentation to occur, sediment must be moved to an environment or place where there is not enough energy to keep it in motion.
In the real world, this usually happens when sediment moves from one depositional environment to another. A depositional environment is a location where sediment is deposited. In other words, it is a place where there is sedimentation. Imagine you wanted to swim. Would you choose a quiet, peaceful lake or a raging river with a powerful current and strong rapids? Given the option between these two depositional environments, one would hope you'd choose the lake. It is the low energy environment. In the river, a high energy environment, you are far more likely to get pulled downstream by the current. Now, imagine you were a piece of sand. Where would you most likely be deposited? Beneath the turbulent waters of the river? Or below the calm water of the lake? Odds are, a sand grain would not be deposited until it was transported down a raging river into a quiet lake environment. We can think about the difference in energy between these environments in terms of water velocity. Water moving at a high velocity with great speed has more energy than water moving slowly at low velocity. It is in slow moving water where sedimentation is most likely to occur. Of course, there's one more factor to consider. Grain size. As you will recall, not all sedimentary particles are the same size. Gravel and pebble sized particles are large. Clay and silt sized particles are small. Intuitively, it takes more energy to move a large, heavy grain than a small, light one. Again, I ask you to imagine this. A friend asks you to help you move a rock. You would be happy to do it within reason. You are far more likely to help them move a small rock in the garden than a huge boulder anywhere else. The same principle applies to sediment moved by natural processes. Natural processes are far more likely to move small particles like clay, silt, or sand than larger particles like pebbles and stones. This scary looking graph is called the Joulström diagram. It is usually applied to rivers and sedimentation in water. However, more generally, it summarizes the relationship between the two factors that affect sedimentation everywhere, flow velocity and particle size. Flow velocity is the speed of the wind or water that is present in an environment. Think of it like energy. The greater the velocity, the greater the energy. Depending on the particle size and the flow velocity, a grain or clast could be transported, deposited, or eroded. Transport means that the particles are being moved. Deposited means that there is sedimentation of the particles. And eroded means that the particles are being removed from the deposit. At a speed of one centimeter per second, clay and silt side particles are transported, while sand sized particles are deposited. As you can see, the relationship is complex. That said, we can make a few generalizations. Generally speaking, small grains like clay and silt travel further than large grains like sand and gravel. Sediment in the ocean comes from land. On the coast, you find beaches of sand. But if you venture further out to sea, you find that the seafloor consists of silt, and in the deepest waters of the ocean, of clay. This clay travels further out to sea than the silt or sand. A related observation deals with the rounding and sorting of grains. 
Recall that sediment may be well sorted and consist of particles that are all the same size. Or it may be poorly sorted and the grains may have many different sizes. Likewise, the particles may be angular in shape or they may be round and spheroidal. Sediment grains become rounder and better sorted as they are transported. An immature sediment located near its place of origin will be poorly sorted and consist of angular grains. As the sediment is transported further and further away, it will become more mature. Its grains will become better sorted and more rounded and spheroidal. Since silt and clay sized particles tend to travel the farthest, they tend to always be well sorted sediments with round grains. At this point, you may be saying to yourself that sedimentation is a far more complex process than you originally thought. And indeed, you would be correct. Sedimentology requires understanding and appreciation of physics, hydrology, and atmospheric science, along with geology. That said, sedimentology opens a doorway to understanding depositional environments of all kinds. As you have seen, the sediment in a depositional environment depends on its hydrodynamic conditions. Different environments have different sediment. Your next challenge is to learn about depositional environments and to think about how their conditions are related to sedimentation. This exercise will prepare you for one of the most important tasks in historical geology. Looking at sedimentary rocks like this coal and determining the depositional environments in which they formed. Only then will you truly be able to travel backward through time.